Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human traditions. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that is going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord, the praise to you, o Christ, has been a very busy week other than me trying to fix the office computer from crashing. It was, that was very busy. That was time consuming. But in the United States, in, our, in media, on, on television and radio, we actually had two events that I think kind of marked uh, a significant part for the United States and for us as a country and a people. And in some ways it plays into what Jesus is talking about today in the Gospel reading. Uh, first, we had uh, Aretha Franklin's uh, death and her funeral. Her funeral that went on forever and ever and ever. Great music, great speakers, except for the one that gave the eulogy, uh, Reverend Johnson. Eh, maybe not. But, nevertheless, we got a sense of who she was as a person. As people came up and commemorated her and memorialized her and talked about not what she said. They talked a lot about how she sung and what she sang, uh, but also just who she was as a person, how she lived her life as a daughter of a preacher who began singing in church on Sundays and then went on to become the queen of Motown. It's a significant person in the culture of our society. And then we had the funeral for Senator John McCain, war hero. When he was able to be released from prison in Vietnam, he refused unless his other uh, captives were also released. He lived a life with a lot of words. He was a talker. He was a politician. But he also had core beliefs and values, and he held to them. And when we hear people this past week talking about him, especially uh, at his funeral at the, the National Cathedral in D.C., you got a really good sense that even though you may disagree, because of his values, because of his heart, his major opponent was also one of his best friends. That says a lot about character, does it not? And both of these people are also people of faith, of totally different traditions, Christian traditions, and also politically, maybe ideologically, maybe different. But they both shared a common core. They knew who they were. 
they knew themselves. And as I just said, as kind of the prequel to my sermon with the kids, as John Calvin said, if you know yourself, you know God. And if you know God, then surely you know yourself. Either way, if you know God first, or you know yourself first, either one, both of them are going to lead you back to God because of humility. Once you know yourself in the light of God, then you know that you need a lot of help. That you know that you yourself, you are not God. That's what the, the hallmark or the cornerstone of the Reformed tradition. If we were to, to find that one theological idea that is unique to the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, it is the sovereignty of God. It is knowing ourselves, knowing God, and knowing that we are not God. But we also understand that no matter what we do, we're never going to win the love of God. Whatever we do cannot make God's change God's change God to do what we want. For instance, there are some in, a, in the Christian traditions that believe that if you go to church every Sunday and you do all of these acts and rites, even if you don't believe them, but if you do it, then you will win God's favor. You will win your salvation. If you spend your money and get the pastor a brand new car or a helicopter, then you are assured salvation. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, keep dreaming. I'm, keep, I'm going to keep dreaming. And we, we could be so, I mean, as I've said multiple times, as you all know, over these last six years, I grew up in the Ozarks, down in the Mid-South. And uh, in those traditions, a lot of the Christian traditions down there are very much about piety doing the right acts in order to be saved. I'm, if you are taught on Sunday by the pastor in the pulpit that you have to go home and do particular things in order not to uh, accumulate the wrath of God, is that really the faith that Jesus is showing us in the gospel? Are you afraid of the wrath of God because you did not tithe today? I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> Jesus today in the gospel really hits the scribes and the Pharisees in an area that we all, in any and every tradition, get into. And that's kind of the clericalism and the legalism. Clericalism, we hear kind of the, the result of an extreme version of clericalism right now in the news with again, the Roman Catholic Church and trying to cover up the abuse. And sometimes that's at the hand of clericalism, meaning that the priests, the pastors, are given so much authority and power that you cannot question them. You cannot question the tradition. You cannot question why we do what we do. And of course, legalism is... I'd say the Bible says that, and therefore you must do it. No questions asked. Jesus points to the Pharisees and the scribes and say, yes, there are these traditions. Yes, my disciples should have gone and washed their hands. Yes, there are these things that we should do according to the book of De Deuteronomy, as Elder Jim read today. Yes, in theory, an idea, in a good world, we should keep all the commandments that are in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Deuteronomy. But how many of you are willing to give up shrimp? <laughs> Such tasty little critters. <clears throat> what Jesus is getting at is the, the, the teaching from the synagogue during the time of the, um, when everybody was taken captive, Jerusalem was destroyed and was carried off uh, to Babylon. And in that tradition, they decided and they discerned that following the rules exactly is not where salvation is. Salvation comes from trusting, believing in God, and hearing God, and 
moving our hearts towards God's heart. We hear it from the prophet Micah, which we, we sing, there's actually a hymn around it. Uh, the prophet Micah says, what is it that the Lord requires of you? How many of you know the answer to it? To live humbly. Something like that. To love justice, well, be kind, to be kind. To love justice and walk humbly with your God. Those are things that have to do with the heart. God is about the worship of your heart. How is your heart worshiping God? How is the Spirit of God dwelling in your heart and in your mind? How is God taking root within your marrow, within your being, and transforming you from the inside out so that your outward actions testify to the inward dwelling of God within you? Today we are celebrating Holy Communion. We're coming forward and we're taking the sacrament this holy act of bread, which Jesus says is his body, and we're partaking and sharing of one cup together, which Jesus says is my blood. Together, when we come to the table, and together are, we recognize and celebrate the freedom that God has given us out of grace, out of nothing that we have done to earn. When we come to this table, we taste and see the love of God. When we come to this table, and we share these meager elements of a meal, a bread and a cup. We're remembering and we're testifying again and again how much we want God to dwell within us. To be a part of our morrow, of our being, of our bodies. How we want God to be a transforming force within our lives. And not just in our ordinary, single, individual lives, but together as a community. Because it is in community, as this sacrament teaches, that true transformation of a heart and our lives becomes fulfilled. Today, come to the table. Come to the table where Christ is the host. Christ leads us. Christ shares with us the bread and the cup. Come to the table. And all of you that are good people, come to the table so that through God and through Christ, you can become a great people. You can be the body and blood of Christ in a world that needs you to testify about character, about a life lived for others. Come. Come to the table. Be unified. Be the body of Christ. I'll praise, honor,